Hello and welcome. Why can't horses get anything done during meetings? Because when it comes time to vote, they all say, nay. In this video, we're going to learn about a concept that's going to last us all the way through to the end of chapter 11. And that concept is called series. Let's get started. A series is just the sum of the terms of a sequence. So whereas a sequence might be a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, and so on, just an ordered list of terms, of numbers, the series is going to be the sum of all those terms. Now it may seem crazy to talk about adding up an infinite number of numbers and getting anything meaningful out of it. Don't these always just blow up to infinity or, or down to negative infinity? Well, the answer is not always the case. Sometimes these, uh, this infinite sum here converges to some number. Now for a series, we can either write it in this expanded form like this, a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 and so on. The key is the, the addition right here. So when you hear, think of series, you're going to be thinking it's the sum, it's this addition. That's the difference. So you can write that summation using summation notation. That's this capital sigma, which is also called capital sigma is also called sigma notation because of the capital sigma. So this is adding up all the terms from n equals one to n equals infinity um, of a sub n. So it's adding these a sub n terms up. So whereas a sub n by itself is a sequence, the sum of the a sub n's is a series. So what does the following series add up to? One half plus one fourth plus one eighth plus one sixteenth plus, and then here we're given the nth term. So this is giving us a formula for getting any term that we want in the series. One over two to the n gives it to us. So in fact, you could rewrite this expanded version of the series as the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over two to the n. Just as a side note, sometimes the, the formatting will look like this. This is like a compact way of writing series, at least in Microsoft Word. <laughs> So it'll put the n equals 1 here and then the infinity up uh, over here. But when it's written using this display mode, and this is most of the time when you write it out in pen, pen and paper, you're going to be writing the n equals 1 down below the sigma and the infinity up above the sigma. So just a little bit about style there. Coming back to our series, let's go ahead and add up the terms one at a time. So the first term here is a half. Let's see what happens when we add a fourth to it. So we'll take a half will add the next term of the series. And we get a half, which is 2 fourths. 2 fourths plus 1 fourth is 3 fourths. OK, so 3 fourths is the sum of the first two terms. Let's add another term, 1 eighth. Here, we'll take the 3 fourths. We'll uh, multiply top and bottom by 2 to get another common denominator, and we get 6, four, six eighths plus 1 eighth, which is 7 eighths. Then we'll add the next term, which would be 1 16th. Again, double the top and the bottom, so we'll get 14 over 16. Notice that those are always going to be apart by 2, because they start being apart by 1, and now they're going to be apart by 2 after we double them. Then when you add 1 16th, that's going to add 1 to the top and bring us up to 15 sixteenths. So after you double, they're apart by 2. When you add 1 to the top, now they're only a, a difference of 1 apart. So the top number is always 1 less than the bottom, in other words. You kind of notice a pattern happening here. Well, the next term would be 1 over 32. If we add that on to this, this running sum that we're keeping track of, you're going to get 31 over 32. Now this is going to continue. Dot, dot, dot. And if you look at the pattern, the numbers on the bottom are just powers of 2, right? This is going to be 2 to the n. 2 to the n. As you keep adding those terms, you're going to get just powers of 2 on the bottom. And on the top, you're going to get 1 less than that. You're going to get the bottom number, which is 2 to the n, minus 1, right? If it's 32 on the bottom, you have 32 minus 1, which is 31 on the top. So this is what the terms look like, uh, sorry, what the, um, the, the summation of the terms is looking like uh, as you add more and more terms. 
Now you could rewrite this by splitting this up into two fractions. 2 over n, 2 to the n divided by 2 to the n is 1, and then minus 1 over 2 to the n. And if you think about what happens as n gets large, that is approaching 1 as n gets large. So as n approaches infinity, as you keep adding more and more and more terms, the sum of all these terms is getting closer and closer to 1. So we can write the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the n, which again represents this sequence here, uh, this uh, series here. <laughs> the sum of all, all the terms of that sequence, which makes the series, uh, then that is just 1. Great, so all those infinite number of terms add up to the finite number 1. What we just calculated above are called the partial sums of the series. So we can denote those by s sub 1, s sub 2, s sub 3, s standing for sum. So s sub 1 is just the first term, s sub 2 is the sum of the first two terms, s sub 3 is the sum of the first three terms, and s sub 4 is the sum of the first four terms, s sub n would be the sum of the first n terms, and you could write it using summation notation if you wanted to. So looking at our example above, This was the first partial sum, 1 half. The second partial sum was 3 fourths. That was the sum of the first two terms, was 3 fourths. S sub 3 was the third partial sum, and that was 7 eighths in our example above. And S sub 4 and S sub 5. This was S sub n, so 2 to the n minus uh, 1 over 2 to the n. That was S sub n, that's the nth partial sum. And that was the one that we took the limit of as n approach, approached infinity, and we got 1 for that. And we said then that the terms of the series, when you add them all up, are going to be equal to 1. So these partial sums here are actually making like a new sequence. You have your original sequence, and then when you add the terms, more and more and more terms, you, you get this partial the sequence of partial sums, and if that sequence of partial sums converges to some number L, we would say that the uh, series is going to converge to L as well. So what it means for uh, a series to converge is if its partial sums converge. And if the partial sums diverge, we would say the series diverges. Okay, so it's really important to get this idea uh, straight between a, a sequence, which is just a list of numbers, in which in this case, these uh, partial sums uh, really just generates for us a list of numbers, right? So this is a, a sequence of partial sums versus a series where you're actually taking some, some terms and you're adding them all up. Like uh, the series would be the original uh, series, one half plus one fourth plus one eighth and so on. That's the series. The, the sequence would be 1 half, comma, 1 fourth, comma, 1 eighth, and so on. The series would be adding up all those terms. And then the partial sums then would be uh, this new sequence that you're generating by adding up more and more and more terms of this given series here. Okay. So one thing is we can visualize the partial sums on a coordinate system, since after all, the partial sums are creating this sequence of partial sums. And so we can put um, n along the x-axis and then s sub n, the partial sums, along the y-axis. So these are not the original terms of the series. These are just the sum of uh, the partial sums of the terms of the series. So this would be like the sum of the first term, which would be a half, the sum of the first two terms, which would be three quarters, the sum of the first three terms, which we found to be seven eighths, and so on. And notice that these partial sums get closer and closer to a value of one. So that was 
uh, visualization in figure one of um, that series that we were looking at uh, as our example. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on. That example that we wrote up there, half comma or half plus one fourth plus one eighth, and so on, is an example of a geometric series. which generally has the form something like this. You have some first term, which we're going to call A. So A sub 1 is just A here. And then to get the next term of the series, you're always multiplying by R, by this thing called R, which is called the common ratio. So you're always multiplying by R. I always think of pirates when I think of geometric series. R. <laughs> All right, so uh, geometric series, you just, to get one term to the next, you're always just multiplying by R. A compact way of writing a geometric series like this using summation notation would look like this. Uh, the sum as n goes from one to infinity of A R to the n minus one. Now in uh, some later sections, you're gonna be sometimes starting n at zero. So I wanna show you what that looks like. So sometimes it's written, sometimes the geometric series is written like this. The sum as n goes from zero to infinity of a r to the n. So that creates the same series. The first term is a, the second term is ar, the second term, the third term is ar squared, and so on. So notice the powers of r have to, like in the in this version right here, the powers of r would have to start at zero, and then one, two, three, four. So to make that happen, if you start with n equals one, you have to have an exponent of n minus one to make sure that when n equals one, that first term, the exponent of r starts at zero. But if n starts at, it starts at zero itself, then you just can have r to the n because you just plug in n equals zero for the first term. A, so, uh, a cannot be zero, otherwise it's not the first term. The first term is the first non-zero term that we're talking about here. Uh, and then r again is called the common ratio. So we might ask, when does a geometric series, a r to the n minus one, converge or diverge? So when does it converge and when does it diverge? Well, to figure that out, we need to figure out what's happening to the partial sums. Need to look at the partial sums. Which are um, denoted S sub N. We're going to break this into two cases. We're going to write case one, the case of the missing terms. <laughs> case one, if r equals one, this is going to be the r equals one term. So if the common ratio is equal to one, then things are pretty straightforward. The partial sums are going to look like this. Well, if r is equal to one, you're going to have one to anything is one, and then a times that is just going to be a, so every single term is going to look like A. Every term in the sequence will look like A. And you're going to have n of these terms if you're looking at the nth partial sum. Right, The nth partial sum adds up the first n terms of the sequence or of the series. And if you uh, do that repeated addition, that's the same thing as multiplication, right? n a's added together is the same thing as n times a. And as n goes to infinity, that is going to go to infinity. Or possibly negative infinity, depending on if a is positive or negative. So in the r equals 1 case, the series diverges.
because the partial sums diverge, so the series diverges. Let's look at case two, which is the only other case. Here we're going to take r to be not equal to 1. That pretty much covers all the values of r. So here the partial sums look like this. The first term is a, the second term is ar, because we still don't know exactly what r is. Third term, ar squared. Then you got a whole bunch of other terms. And then the last term, the nth term, will be ar to the n minus 1. Right? If you plug in n, uh, you're going to get ar to the n minus 1. So that's the sum of the first n terms. Now, if we're going to try to figure out the limit as n approaches infinity of the partial sum, it'll be helpful to have a nice closed form for the partial sum. And when we have these dot, dot, dots here, that's not closed form. So we got to somehow get rid of all these terms that are, uh, you know, you have a variable number of terms depending on how big n is. We're going to try to get rid of as many of those terms as possible and just have a finite number of operations to get uh, s sub n. And the trick is like this. We're going to take this whole equation here and multiply it through by r. So we'll have r times s sub n on the left. Now on the right, that r will distribute to each of these terms. And you'll have a times r, which is ar. I'm going to write ar, that term, to line up with this other ar term. Then if you take ar and multiply it by r, you get ar squared. Then if you take ar squared and multiply it by r, you're going to get ar to the third, which would line up with something inside of these dot, dot, dots as well. I'm going to just write a little dot, dot, dot right here as well. Now the term that comes right before ar to the n minus 1 is going to be ar to the n minus 2. If you multiply that by r, you're going to get ar to the n minus 1. So you're going to get some kind of ar to the n minus 1 uh, in this second row, second equation. And then ar to the n minus 1 times r is going to give you another r. So this is going to be ar to the n. So basically, multiplying by r just shifts all of those terms over when you think about lining them up in columns based on the powers of r. Now we're going to get rid of all those middle terms. And here's how we're going to do it. Subtract. On the left side, we're going to get s sub n minus r times s sub n. And on the right side, all of these middle terms are canceling. So we get the ars are going to be gone. The ar squares are going to be gone. All of these things are going to be gone inside here. And the ar to the n minus 1s will be gone as well. So all that's left is going to be a and then minus ar to the n. Remember that minus distributes to all of those terms. So we just took out the dot, dot, dot. We took out all those middle terms, which is great. Now we're going to try to find s sub n by factoring out the s sub n. We'll go ahead and factor out the a as well while we're at it. And then divide by 1 minus r. So these are, this is the nth partial sum of the geometric series. Now we're going to want to take the limit as n approaches infinity uh, of this, of this uh, nth partial sum. And the part of it that's going to change or that's going to determine if this uh, converges or diverges as a, um, as a sequence of numbers is this part right here. It's the r to the n. That's the only place in this entire expression where n makes a difference, right? is this r to the n term. So if we want to know what happens, to s sub n as n approaches infinity. We're just going to look at r to the n. That's the only thing that really is doing anything when r gets bigger. Right? The, the a is staying at a. The r is staying at r. It's just the r to the n that gets uh, either larger or possibly does something else. <laughs> Trying not to give away what we're about to give away in the next minute, next second. So here it breaks down into a couple of cases. If 
r is a fraction, a proper fraction, raised right, you know, in the right environment, <laughs> a proper fraction. So a proper fraction is one where the, the top is uh, smaller than the bottom, right? And it could be positive or, or negative. So that's between negative one and one. Then r to the n is going to approach zero. Because if you keep multiplying by that fraction over and over and over again, the numbers will just keep getting smaller. If you take a half and you keep multiplying by a half and a half and a half, you're always going to get half the number, which is going to be closer to zero. So these proper fractions, when you raise them to the nth power, are going to go to zero as n approaches infinity. Oops, did that again. As n approaches infinity. And so when you take the limit as n approaches infinity um, of s sub n, this part of it, the r to the n will go to zero. You'll just have a times one minus zero, which is a on the top, and then one minus r on the bottom. So this limit will be a over one minus r. And since the sequence of partial sums approaches, uh, converges to a over one minus r, so does the series. period. If r is not a proper fraction, so that means if r is less than or equal to negative 1, or if r is greater than 1, whoop, <laughs> you might be thinking, well, what about if r is equal to 1? Well, we handled that in case number 1, thankfully. We covered our bases. So these are the only other possible r values that we can consider. Well, then r to the n is going to diverge. 2 to the n will just diverge. It'll blow up to infinity. So uh, s sub n as a sequence diverges. And so the series will diverge. There we go. So the little table on the bottom right of the page summarizes this. It says if you've got a geometric series, it's going to converge to a over 1 minus r if r is between negative 1 and 1. And the, this is just a shorter way of writing r between negative 1 and 1 is the absolute value of r is less than 1. And it's going to diverge if uh, otherwise. So if the uh, r is greater than or equal to 1, or r is less than or equal to negative 1. Because we saw it diverge when r is equal to 1, and then it also diverges in all these other cases as well. All right. Let's go ahead and use that, uh, this um, summary here that we came up with in example 1, where it says find the sum of this geometric series. This is a geometric series. Now we can't just look at that and, and, and say, all right, it's geometric because I want it to be geometric. We have to you know, think about it and say, okay, is that really geometric? Well, if it is geometric, then you know, this right here would be A. To figure out what R, the common ratio would be, well, we can say that you know the next term is a r right. That's the next. That's a general way of writing the next term. Or you can think like if the first term is a, you multiply by some common ratio r to get the next term. So this is a r equals negative ten thirds. But uh, here a is five, so five r equals negative ten thirds. If you take five and you multiply it by r, you'll get negative ten thirds. If it's going to be geometric. So you get r equals negative 2 thirds. And then you can just double check. Or is it always the case that you're multiplying by negative 2 thirds to get the next term? And it seems to check out. Negative 10 thirds times negative 2 thirds is positive 20 ninths. Positive 20 ninths times negative 2 thirds is negative 40 over 27. That's checking out. So the pattern here um, you know, is, is going to continue. This is a geometric series. So the sum of this geometric series is going to be a over 1 minus r, which would be 5 over 1 minus negative 2 thirds. 
And if you work that out, we'll just work it out by hand here. I'm going to go ahead and clear out that little fraction that's bothering me. Go away, little fraction. <laughs> so we have 3 plus 2 on the bottom. So this is 15 over 5, which is 3. There we go. So this geometric series adds up to 3 if you add up all the infinite terms of the geometric series. That's pretty cool. OK. One more example before we take a break. <laughs> before I take a break. <laughs> and that's example two, which says express 2.317 repeating uh, as the ratio of two integers. So here the one and the seven are repeating over and over and over again. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take 2.317171717 dot 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 and write it as a summation. We're going to write this as 2.3, that's the non repeating decimal part, plus just the first uh, part that's repeating, so the 0 0.017, then the next part that's repeating, 0 0.00017, then the next part that's repeating, point zero 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 one seven okay so that's those first three of those 17s written in their decimal places and now I'm going to rewrite these using fractions just to get a little bit of a better view on them so this is 23 over 10 plus 17 over one two three zeros so 17 over a thousand plus 17 over a one and then one, two, three, four, five zeros, plus 17 over a one with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven zeros, dot, dot, dot. It's a little easier to see what's happening in fraction form. Because now what we've got is, well, the first term, set that aside, the 23 over 10, the rest of these terms is a geometric series. This is a geometric series. What's the A in this geometric series? If you said 17 over 1,000, that would be correct. It's not 23 over 10, because that doesn't fit with the rest of the series. It starts, the geometric series here starts with 17 over 1,000. That's our A. What's our common ratio R? If you said 1 over 100, that would be correct. That's what you have to multiply to get from one term of the series to the next term. You multiply by 1 over 100. Multiplying by 1 over 100 is effectively shifting you two decimal places to the right, uh, so that you're looking at the next pair of digits. So that's a geometric series with A equals 17 over 1,000 and R equals 100, 1 over 100. We can figure out where this con what this converges to. It converges to A over 1 minus R. which is 17 over 1,000 over 1 minus 1 over 100. This is 17 over 1,000 over, and put parentheses so we don't get lost in this tower of fractions. Hmm, probably should have just cleared it out with my little trick. Over uh, 99 over 100, and if you work this one out, you end up getting, uh, so this is 17 over 1,000 times 100 over 99. You end up getting the 100 canceling, and so you have 17 over 990. And that's just the geometric series part of it. You still have the 23 over 100, or over 10. So you're going to take that plus 17 over 990. And when you combine those two fractions and simplify, you end up with 140, uh, one, <laughs> 1,147 over 495. 
So there we've expressed this repeating decimal as the ratio of two integers, as a fraction with an integer on the top and an integer on the bottom. So that's pretty cool. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.